is Parshas Truma, where we talk about the construction of the Mishkan, the movable tabernacle in the desert. The topic of our discussion today is the Mishkan and the Temple. We'd like to create a little bit of a contrast very briefly, just to make a, just to make a very simple observation. I just want to bring out two points that we can find about the Mishkan. One is at the very beginning of Parshas Truma, it says, Daber el b'nei Yisrael, in Pasuk Bez, Bez, it says, Speak to the Jewish people, v'yikhuli teruma, they should all take a, a teruma, a donation for the temple. Me'es kol isha asher yidavenu libo, from any person whose heart so inspires him to give t'kuas teruma, see, he shall take donations. A donation by definition is what? Is voluntary. Yes, yeah, so people, there was no coercion to donate to the construction of the Mishkan. Do we understand, we appreciate that? The only thing that every Jew had to give was the Mahatzisa Shekel. Anything beyond that was purely voluntary, it was a donation. One of the funny things I remember from when President Clinton was running for president, he, it was because he talked about how they're going to have to raise taxes. And I remember the big thing was that he said, we're just going to ask every American to contribute more. And so everyone you know, pick, because obviously when you're a politician, you have to choose your words very carefully. So the question was, how can you ask people to contribute if you're taxing them? That's an oxymoron. People don't contribute taxes. People pay taxes because they have to, right? So this was clearly a voluntary donation that was being called upon the Jewish people to give. The other interesting facet of the construction of the Mishkan is that not only did it involve voluntary donations, but also um, God employs very special people to build the Mishkan. If you take a look at uh, Parshish Kitisa, which we'll read in a couple of weeks, it says that God selects B'tzalel ben Uri ben Chur Lamate Yehuda, and it says, Va'amaleo so ruach Elohim. God says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. V'chachma u'visvuna u'vedas u'v'chol malacha. I've given him wisdom and understanding and knowledge about how to do all the work of the, tem of the tabernacle, of the Mishkan. Later on it says that Hashem says, nasati ito ben I'm going to give him another artisan who is just as skilled, uh, a haliyav. Uvalev kol chacham lev nasati chachma. And in the heart of every wise person, I've given the wisdom to be able to help Betzal construct the Mishkan. So it seems like the people that were chosen to build the Mishkan were, were hand-picked by HaKadosh Baruch Hu and imbued with a certain special spirit of pr uh, prophetic ability to know exactly what Hashem wanted in the construction of the Mishkan. This Shabbos we're going to read a Haftorah from Melachim Beis, the Melachim Aleph, which talks about the construction of the first temple, of Solomon's temple, of the Beis HaMikdash of Shlomo HaMelech. And just note, uh, note, note a couple of things. Number one, it says that, and I'm just going to jump into where it talks about the uh, two things that I want to sort of bring out that are glaring at us in the text. One is Malachim Aleph Perak Hey Pasuk Chaf Zayim. And that is Vaya'al HaMelech Shalomo Mas Mikol Yisrael Vayhi HaMas Shaloshim Elafish That King Solomon instituted a tax upon uh, the Jewish people and uh, he taxed the people that they should all be forcibly conscripted to donate and to build the, the temple. So the first thing that you see over here is that this was not a voluntary, it's not that people came forward and voluntarily donated to the construction of the Beis HaMikdash as they did for the Mishkan. Another thing that's quite curious is that who were the contractors and the builders of the Beis HaMikdash? Well, in Pasuk Chafav it says, Vashem Nasan Chacham Ali Shlomo Kasher Di Berlo. That Hashem had uh, instilled wisdom within Shlomo. Vayhi Shalom Ben Chiram Melech Shlomo Vayichasu Barishanehem. And there was peace. There was a treaty that was enacted between Chiram, who was a neighboring kingdom, uh, the, the king of the neighboring kingdom, and between Shlomo. And they made, they made a covenant with each other. And as a result, it says, um, by, in Pasuk Lamed Beis, by Yifsalu Bonei Shalomo Uvonei Chirom Vahagivlim, by Achino Ha'itzim Vehaavonim Livnos Abayis. You have 
the builders of Solomon, together with the builders of Chirom and the Giblim, which is an entire fo- an, another foreign nation, and these people are all working together to manufacture the stones of the Beis Hamikdash. So we now have foreigners building, doing the work for us. We have non-Jews engaged in the construction of the Beis Hamikdash. Not only do we not have Bitzalel and Ahaliyav engaged in the construction of the Beis Hamikdash. But we have people who are not even part of our people who are engaged in the construction. And it seems to be somewhat counter uh, what we would expect of a holy structure like this. Another thing that we should, uh, we should consider, and just to ask as a general question, <coughs> is that we know that Shlomo was a very wise man. But why does the why does the pasuk in the Nach and back, going back to pasuk Chavav why does it associate his wisdom to the fact that he had a treaty between himself and King and King and King Chiram? What is why does that require wisdom? You can make a treaty even if you're not a smart king. Not only that, but if you look earlier in the Perik, it already says in pasuk Test that Hashem had given Chachma to Shlomo that God had given a wise heart to Shlomo that was as broad as the, the sands on the beach. So why does it have to repeat it again in Pasuk Chavav to say that Hashem had given wisdom to Shlomo and this was, was the cause of him making a peace treaty with, with Chiram. I noticed that um, Rav Rivlin from Karen Biyat has a beautiful sefer on the Haftorahs and he, he wants to suggest that there's a distinction between a Mishkan that's built by a nation who don't have a king versus the construction of a temple done by a nation which already has a king. The will of the king represents the will of the people, and therefore as long as the king constructs the temple of his own volition, then it is as if the people have built it of their own volition, even if they're conscripted for that purpose, because the king's will represents the people's will. And that, that, that could be that could be one of the ways to sort of explain why there's a, a distinction between the construction of the temple and the construction of the Mishkan. But I think what we have to ultimately acknowledge is that there is a, a clear distinction uh, between the generation that left Mitzrayim and built the Mishkan and the generation that constructed the Beis HaMikdash. Number one, the project had changed. It was a much larger scale project. It required thousands of skilled laborers um, and it required people who had even greater skill than the Jewish people themselves. There had been carpenters and smiths who had been living in the region of Canaan for centuries longer than the Jewish people and perhaps they were more qualified to do the skilled labor whereas in, in the desert the Jewish people were the only ones available so it was necessary for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to instill the artisans in the desert with uh, extra Ruach HaKodesh, with divine inspiration to know what to do where it wasn't necessary over here. Um, one of the things that the Mephorshim ask is what right did Shlomo have to make a covenant or a treaty with King Chiram? Because the Torah explicitly says Lo beris lo that you're not allowed to make a covenant, you're not allowed to make a treaty with the surrounding nations when you come into the land of Israel. The Torah says that explicitly, Lo tichrot lehem berit velo You're not allowed to make a covenant with them. And Tosfus asked this question in the Talmud in a couple of places. You even have it on your sheet. Tosfus asked the question, V'im tomar ve'echi, this is in Tosfus Yevamos da'chaf gimel amet alef. Tosfus asks, Hechi korat berit shalomo im chiram melech tzor. What right did uh, Shlomo have to make a covenant with the king of tzor? Um, it says they made a covenant with each other. The Torah says you're not allowed to do that. And this prohibition of making a treaty with the other nations encompasses all the nations, not just the seven Canaanite nations. Tosfus gives a number of different answers, and of course this will have wide-reaching ramifications to the way the Israeli government conducts itself even Bisman Hazet because if there's a prohibition of creating treaties and covenants with surrounding nations what right did we have to make a treaty with Egypt and with Cairo and with uh, Jordan um, that seems, a little, seems to be 
a bit problematic according to what the Torah says. You may not make a treaty with them. So you have to look at Tosfos and he says, That uh, the only time that there's a prohibition is if the treaty involves the invocation of an idolatry in the, in the course of making the treaty. And another answer he gives is, Another answer could be is that uh, King Hiram was not an idolater. And as a result, there was no prohibition. But ordinarily, Tosas gives another answer. He says, "The lomitzer krisus bris aladavka b'shiva umos." Perhaps I was mistaken in my initial thinking that it encompasses all nations. Perhaps it's only a prohibit, prohibited to enter into a treaty with only the seven Canaanite nations, and not with the other nations that surround the land of Israel. But in any event, it's problematic. So why should the pasuk? instead of saying that, acknowledging at least that there was some problem, instead say that this was a result of King Solomon's great wisdom. I think that um, there are times in Jewish history when we come to optimal situations and we come to less optimal situations. The utopian Jewish environment of the desert was just that. It was utopian. And to expect the Jewish people to rise to an occasion of where the only way that we're going to be able to build our next temple is through someone in, imbued with Ruach HaKodesh, David HaMelech knew this and Shlomo HaMelech knew this, that the world, that this was not the time for the world to be able to engage in that kind of, of project. It was possible for HaKodesh Baruch Hu, there's nothing impossible for Hashem. If Hashem wanted to create 30,000 builders, each one of which was imbued with Chachma slave through Ruach HaKodesh, HaKodesh Baruch Hu could have done that. But the generation was not ready for that kind of miraculous, overt kind of mass uh, Ruach HaKodesh. The generation simply was not prepared for it. And therefore HaKodesh Baruch Hu allowed for the construction of the Beis HaMikdash on a much more uh, natural um, non-miraculous way and there, there was nothing deemed improper about it it was not considered to be a bad thing it was not considered to be wrong for the fact that non-Jews participated in the construction of a holy edifice because it's not the, the, the people who build the edifice who sanctify it but it is rather the Shekhinah, the divine presence which occupies the edifice which sanctifies it it's very important for us to keep this in mind because a number of people have argued that the state of Israel today has no inherent sanctity because it was founded by apikorsim, by heathens, by, by people who, who don't believe in God. And as a result, that in itself is the greatest proof that Medinat Yisrael has no, le has no legitimacy. And I think that would be a very flawed argument based on what we've just presented to you here. Is that if even the Beis Hamikdash can be built by non-Jews, by non-believers, and even by idolaters, then the state of Israel, the modern day homeland for the Jewish people, can also be built in that way. For the very simple reason is that it's not the time for miracles has not yet arrived. But that doesn't, that doesn't at all indicate that God is not part of the endeavor. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is part of the endeavor of bringing the Jewish people back to Eretz Yisrael and having a government that, where we have the ability to govern over ourselves. The fact that it was started by, the, by Chalutzim, who were not religious, is totally irrelevant. It's a reflection of the inferiority of the generation, not of the inferiority of the project itself. So I hope that's, if you can only take that out of this message of the <coughs> contrast between the Mishkan and the Beis HaMikdash, I hope that's something that you can take out of a very positive thing. But just to conclude, we'll take a look at a Midrash, which does create a contrast between the Mishkan and the Beis HaMikdash. And with this we will finish. It's on the bottom of your sheet, and it's from Tana Devei Eliyahu Rabbah, Yud Ches. And it says, Ashrehem shel tzadikim, she'ein sonei sholeit b'ma'ase yedehem. That fortunate are the righteous who do not need an enemy 
to be incorporated with their handiwork. Meaning that a true tzaddik never re has to rely on a bad person to help him accomplish things in life. Shekain motzinu b'mishkan sha'asa Moshe, shalo shalat bo sone. As we find that Moshe Rabbeinu, who was a great tzaddik, did not need to rely on enemy nations or, or people who were hostile to the Jewish people to get the job done. He could build a Mishkan without having to rely on Chira uh, Melech Tzor or anyone else. And as a result, the Mishkan was not destroyed in a horrible fashion, as was the case by, uh, by the Temple. But with the Temple of Solomon, it was, there was reliance upon enemy people, on, on people from the outside, on people who don't like Judaism. We relied on them to help us build our great edifice, our great temple, and as a result it eventually had to collapse. But with the final temple, the third temple that we will, hopefully will be built very, very speedily in our days, by that time, when it comes time to build the third base on Mikdash, we won't need Arabs to help us, we won't need anyone to help us build it, we'll be able to build it by ourselves. And as a result, Hashem will live in that temple forever and ever. So while it's true that the generation defines how the project is going to be accomplished, we also have to acknowledge that the fact that we have a wonderful state of Israel today and the fact that it is run by secular authorities means that it's not optimal. It's not, it's not the greatest thing. It is what it is. it is. It is the project that was deemed appropriate by HaKadosh Baruch Hu in our in the 20th century because of the non-miraculous nature of our generation. But that means that we have something to look forward to. We have to look forward to the sort of the rededication of the next kingdom of Israel, which will come in the times of Mashiach, which will be, uh, which will be governed and ruled over by Mashiach ben David, who will be, of course, this great spiritual leader as well as the great governmental and military leader as well. It should happen in the mayor of the Amen.